I would say how you do anything is how you do everything. I know football is not going to last forever. So I wanted to make sure I had enough income coming in, use that money to live, even if football wasn't in the picture anymore. I plan on doing real estate the rest of my life. I don't have to be in a rush. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I am your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Devon Kennard. Devon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Robert. I appreciate it. Not everyone who is listening to the show today is a football fan. So just quickly give us an overview of your background and your NFL career. You know, I think it starts back when I was a kid. I'm actually a second generation NFL player. My dad played in the NFL. And the one memory I have of that was when he won the 1996 Super Bowl with the Dallas Cowboys. There's like a picture of me in Sports Illustrated on his shoulders with my with my arm up and That was kind of the moment I realized, yeah, I really want to follow in his footsteps and and pursue an NFL dream as well. And, you know, I've been chasing him my whole life since then. I'm now in my ninth year in the NFL. You know, I played for the New York Giants, then the Detroit Lions and the Arizona Cardinals. And this year has been a bit crazy. I started out with the Cardinals and then now I'm with the Baltimore Ravens. So been jumping around and And uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great journey. Being in the NFL is, you know, a dream come true, but it also comes with many challenges that I think prepares you for life. So it's, uh, you know, something that I really have been able to appreciate over the years. I've always wondered, and this is not real estate related, we'll get into your real estate stuff, too. But I've always wondered, is it easier for somebody to make the NFL if their father, uncle, brother, somebody like that has been in the league, or is it still the same kind of process for everybody? I would say it's an advantage if you allow it to be an advantage, you know, because it could be a disadvantage too. Because on the flip side, you can say, oh, your dad made it, so you're a little entitled or you're not as hungry as the as the kid who, you know, dad didn't make it. And now you got to, he has to like really work even harder to make it to the NFL you know, being a second generation guy, it's like, all right, what kind of mindset are you going to take and how are you going to approach your work every day to get to the goals that you have? Yeah, that makes sense. I once heard that less than 2% of college football players make it to the NFL and that the average career for a pro football player is less than, than four years. Being a smart guy and you knew the odds of making it to the league, even though your dad was there, did you have a fallback plan or a plan B if football didn't work out? And how do you think about backup plans and plan B's in general? I did not at first. So, you know, I I always say that I was in high school and plan A, B, and C was like, oh, I'm going to make it to the NFL one day. But uh, life humbled me. My senior year of high school, I was a top five recruit in the nation, which means, you know, uh, there's only four players that were, you know, considered higher than me. Um, coming into college, but I tore my ACL my senior year of high school, which is a tragic injury to have as a perfect, as a, you know, even amateur athlete. And my college career kind of was inundated with injuries as well, which made me really kind of take a step back and be like, I want to make it to the NFL, but what do I want my life to look like? You know, if I don't make it or like, what do I want my life to look like? Period. Cause I, I made the decision for me. It's like, whether it's through football or not, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be able to live a life of financial freedom and live on my terms. And it's like, I always saw that life from the eyes of a football player. But if that's taken away from me, what what will it look like? And I think that started to really shift how I approached everything in my life, really even in college. It was like, all right, I'm going to take advantage of this free education. I went to the University of Southern California in LA, one of the most prestigious universities. And my mindset was get as much school done as possible because it's free. So I graduated with my undergrad in three years. I got my master's degree in a year and a half. And more than more important than those degrees was networking and trying to kind of get a sense of what are some industries that interested me and and connecting with people who were successful and finding out what they did. And that's when I first kind of was introduced to real estate. And I have a mentor I met. And, you know, he started out as a police officer and his wife was a teacher and he bought one property and then bought another one. And, you know, now years later, he owns he owns and operates thousands of properties in the Los Angeles area. And it kind of sparked something and flipped the switch for me in college because I was like, if this man was able to do that off of a off of, you know, a police officer and teacher salary, then 
you know, I have no excuse. I can go and pursue that as well. And I think that's where I kind of got my first interest in like, okay, real estate might be the thing for me. Were you interested in considering financial freedom back in high school when you were thinking about potential plan Bs? In high school, the lifestyle like definitely was already kind of, I already wanted, but yeah, it, the vantage point was from the eyes of an athlete, you know, like, oh, that's how I was going to do it. And I didn't really have other plans. Like it was, I wanted to be successful. I knew that. And a easy succession plan is, oh, I'm going to be an athlete and then I'll get into like broadcasting. So I always thought like, all right, I'm going to, you know, you see so many ex players go that route. So like my mindset was tunnel visioned on the cliche, like, oh, I'm going to play and have this long NFL career. And then I'm going to be talking about football for the rest of my life on TV. And that's kind of how I saw it. And as I got older, I started to realize like, all right, there's other ways that I can get what I want. You mentioned that you were a top recruit coming out of high school. You went to USC. You also had a 3.8 GPA while you were there and you got your degrees in, in a much shorter period of time than, than normal. But you were also nominated for the prestigious Walter Payton Man of the Year Award in 2019 for your philanthropic work with Detroit. And obviously you've been building a pretty sizable real estate portfolio. Talk to us about how you've maintained this high level of motivation for so long, as well as any time management or productivity tips that you have for our listeners that want to take their life and their investments to the next level. I would say how you do anything is how you do everything. So be very spot on with the things that you're going to give your time to and, and be the best that you can at those things. So I rather focus on a few things and be the absolute best I can at those things than doing 101 things. So for me, what what's important, you know, family, football, my financial well-being, and I kind of solved that through investing in real estate and giving back and teaching, teaching the next generation of kids how to become financially free, how to be successful, especially minorities, you know, all throughout this country. I feel like I've been privileged to be an African-American man, but as successful as I've been able to have and be in the position I've been put in from having a father who was in the NFL and then being able to play in the NFL myself. So I've been in rooms that a lot of minorities aren't, aren't able to get in. And, you know, I feel like it's my responsibility to bridge that gap and show more people the different ways they can get out of their situations, improve their well-being, improve their life. And, you know, being able to do that by setting an example with how I'm living my life in all facets has kind of been my motivation all along. Where did you learn that quote, uh, how you do one thing is how you do everything? Uh, I think it's a football analogy I probably heard from a coach at some point, and it just really resonated with me because I feel like how things are going for me off the field impact on the field. You know, the quality of person, you can't be, I can't be a hardworking, oh, I'm going to go get it on the football field. And then I go home and, and I'm a husband, father. I'm not putting that same kind of effort into the other things that I say matter. I feel like it's much easier to be consistent. So the roles that I'm going to play in my life, I'm going to give my best, my best effort and my best foot forward. And, you know, I feel like if you take that perspective, then it goes across the board and that's just the standard in your life. So you don't have to turn it on and turn it off. People who turn it on and turn it off in, in so many different areas of their life, I feel like you become depleted and you're, and you're not reaching your full potential. Have you ever listened to any of Eric Thomas's speeches either on YouTube? I know he's been to some NFL teams. So I don't know maybe if you were in the locker room when he did that. I've never heard him in person, but I've definitely heard him um, speak a lot. And he talks about some of those things himself, but he's a very motivating guy. I, you know, I really look up to, you know, kind of his message. Yeah, you, you mentioned standards and that the first thing I think of is E.T. I listen to his videos all the time. He's probably my favorite motivational guy. I love I love a lot of what he talks about. I think I remember a few years ago when it was the thing like you got to want to be successful more than you want to breathe type of type of deal. I think, you know, that's exaggerated, obviously, but I think the point in that is you can't have options of being unsuccessful, of not achieving of being the best and success is all relative to you. Like, I feel like you got to maximize the gifts that you've been given. And, you know, there's a parable in the Bible that I really refer to a lot. And it talks about like, there was a, you know, an owner who had three slaves and he's leaving town and, and he gives one slave, five bags of gold, another slave, two, and another one, one. And he's like, you know, go do something with this. And when I get back, I'm going to see what you did. 
The guy with five bags um, went and invested it and turned it to 10. The guy with two bags went and invested it and turned it, turned it to four. The guy with one bag decided he wasn't going to do anything with it, buried the money and just waited till the master came back. And, you know, when he comes back, he awards the guy who multiplied his five bags to 10, his two bags to four, and then kind of denounced the man who didn't do anything. And that always resonated with me because whether you're the guy with five bags, two bags, or one bag, what did you do with what you've been given? God's given us gifts. You've been in position. You have certain skill sets. You have certain abilities. And are you maximizing those to the best of your ability and getting the most out of yourself in all facets of life? And if you are, then, you know, you can look in the mirror every day and be proud of the person you see and what you've accomplished. But if you're, if you don't want to be the person with one bag who's been given a certain skill set, abilities, you, uh, circumstances through what your parents have given you, whatever, and did nothing with it. Yeah. I love that. I love that story. And ET talks about this, this, but having standards, but he says basically that you need to have, you need to set a standard for yourself and you need to hold yourself to it. And he talks about one of my favorite videos is he says, you owe you. And basically what he's saying is like, you hold all these other people to a standard. He uses an example where you'll go to the store and if the store tells you that a product or service that you're buying is going to do something for you, and if it doesn't do that within 30 days, you go back to them and you're like, hey, I want a refund. It didn't do it. But then he flips that and says, well, like, you don't hold yourself to that same standard. You tell yourself you're going to do this stuff all the time and you don't do it. So you need to basically his videos, you owe you like you need to hold yourself to the same standard that you're holding other people to. And if you tell yourself you're going to do something, you need to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I I think I haven't heard that one, but that's that's incredible. I think that's a really good point. Go check it out. It's U O U on on YouTube. I think I think you'll enjoy it. But during my research for this interview, I learned that you're pretty frugal and you save about fifty percent of your income. And I personally love the story about how you drove your high school car, which is a Kia, during your first season in the NFL. And then one of the most more famous ESPN's Thirty for Thirties is titled "Broke," and it's about how all these professional athletes experience horrendous financial circumstances after their careers. And it even says that upwards of 78% of former NFL players have gone bankrupt or are under serious financial stress. Talk to us about how you developed your financial habits, who influenced you and how you've avoided many of the temptations that life as a professional athlete comes with. I decided, I, I would say probably in college at some point that where I was like, if I'm like, I want to take advantage, if I do make it to the NFL, whether it's one year or 10 years, I want to take advantage of the amount of money I can make in a short time of, in a short span of time. Cause even if I only played one year, I'll be 23 when I, my first year in the NFL. And at least that year, I'm going to make more money than most people my age are making. So I can use that. And how can I use that to catapult me into the, towards the life that I wanted? So my mindset was like, okay, I got drafted. I don't know how long I'm going to play, but. I'm bringing my high school car. I'm not buying a car because I want to use this money to catapult me. And if this is my only year ever playing in the NFL, I want to be able to say I saved majority of that money. And now it's putting me in a position to invest and to do things and get me a few steps ahead of every other 23 year old, 24 year old who's, um, you know, just getting out of college and entering the workforce. So that was my mindset and my motivation. And it's the concept of delayed gratification. It's not that I didn't want a nicer car, but my mindset was I want to be able to pick and choose a nice car to drive the rest of my life, not when I'm 23. And then later, later on, I'm 30 something. And, and now I'm downgrading my cars because I'm not, I'm out of the NFL and those, those expenses are too high. I wanted to be able to, to sustain that in my thirties, forties and fifties. So let me make the sacrifices now. And it, it was tough. You know, you're, you're in a culture where I'm I'm pulling into the driveway. I was with the New York Giants. I'm seeing Rolls Royces, Phantoms, you know, Lambos, all these different kind of cars. And I'm pulling up in a 2005 Kia Sorento. Definitely wasn't the sexiest thing, but felt I was really strong. And I might be able to buy those things one day, but I don't need to do it right now. Based on the timeline, I don't think that his story that I'm about to mention was popular yet. But in the last couple of years, it's become popular that uh, the story that of Gronk who only spends his endorsement money. He basically says that he, I believe that's what it is. He spends only his endorsement money yeah. to saves all of his NFL money. Do you look at guys like that as kind of inspiration and you know, did that help you at all with the decisions you've made financially with your NFL earnings? 
I think it was kind of what my mindset is. It's kind of along the same lines of a grog to where, you know, for me, even so my first year in the NFL, I drove my that 2005 Kia Sorento. But my next car was a car deal that I got with a local car dealership. And I so and it was a free Kia Cadenza. So it was nicer, but it was still a Kia. And, uh, you know, I drove that for three years. I didn't buy my first car until I got my next big contract when I went to the Detroit Lions. And even then I bought it with marketing money, not my NFL money. I've always felt like the real flex is making NFL money, investing it and being able to buy things with my investment money from there. So, you know, it's like, it's one step, it's an extra step, right? So I'm not just making NFL money and spending it. I'm making NFL money, investing it, making that money, earn me more money. And then, and then if you want to buy, you know, some lavish things or, you know, you want to treat yourself to something, I feel like that's the real flex is when you, when you're doing that with passive income instead of earned income. I'm a car guy myself. So I'm curious, what was that first car that you bought yourself? First one was a Range Rover Sport. And even with that, I was kind of trying to be, I really wanted like the autobiography, big body Range Rover. And then, but those were so expensive. I kind of talked myself out of it. I got the Range Rover Sport and now I'm in my ninth year and I finally bought the big, the big body one that I've always wanted. Um, But it took me nearly being in the NFL a decade to finally get the car that I, that I really always wanted. So that, um, you know, I'm not, a super car person, but for what, whatever reason, a Range Rover was always like what I envisioned myself driving. So I finally got my dream car now. I'd say you've earned it. Good to be noted that my, <laughs> yeah, but my, uh, my real estate portfolio paid for it and my business owns it. It's funny because my brother, you know, I, I think just like you, you and I have the same mindset. For me, it's like you could have bought your dream car right at the beginning if you wanted, but you, like you said, it was delayed gratification. You waited a little bit later. And and for me, it's, it's not maybe that car, but for, for me, it's, I've been house hacking th- ever since I got out of college or, and I was in college. I bought my first house when I was a senior in college and I've been house hacking ever since. And when you house hack, I mean, you can buy nice properties, but generally they're not as like your dream home. And so for me, my, my brother's a little bit younger and he's like, Oh, he always gives me crap. He's like, Hey, you know, you're this big shot real estate investor. You have a podcast, all this. Why are you living in this little duplex? Why don't you have some like fancy mansion? And I'm like, because that's the whole point. Like I, I, maybe I could buy that right now, but that's not what I'm trying to do. Like I'm trying to wait. I'm only 27 right now. Like I started this when I was 21. Like, can you imagine? I'll just wait till I'm 30. I've only, I'm still 30 right. years old. I'm super young. Like I go get a, a, my dream house then. And I've done 10 years of investing and I've set myself up for the rest of my life. So it's funny. It's just like, it doesn't matter if you're in the NFL or if you're just a normal person like me. It's like, everybody's kind of dealing with the same type of like delayed gratification concept. Yeah. And I think that mindset, you're going to, what you are doing by the moves you can make now by investing in things instead of buying that dream house, it's going to make that dream house easier. Like, you know, I finally bought the house that I, that I wanted in our long-term home and it was right around when I was uh, turning 30. And now I'm, now I'm in a position where my passive income covers, covers the mortgage and all of those things to where you know, like that's a freeing feeling. You you know, your all your major expenses are covered for, and you're living in the house that you always wanted to live in. I've always wondered how do NFL players deal with moving or getting traded if they have their dream house? So you just mentioned you bought your dream house. I know you got traded this year. Got you, you know went to the Ravens from Arizona. So how does how does real estate play into that piece of it? Well, this that whole situation is crazy. So I've been with the Cardinals the last two and a half years, and the business of it, they, they drafted a couple of young guys that they really liked. So they, they know I'm a good player, but essentially um, wanted to get rid of me because they wanted the young guys to play. It's a young man's league. So they, they want to get rid of me in the middle of the year. They released me on, on a Friday. It's officially announced Saturday. Once it's officially announced at 4 PM that Saturday, the Ravens called me and they asked me to hop on a plane and come sign with them the next day or you know the next day so i find out friday and officially happened saturday i had less than 24 hours and i had to pack a bag come to baltimore and i've been here ever since uh so for the last couple of weeks i've been in baltimore they put me up at a hotel for seven days for free and pretty much i had to figure it out from there so i found an airbnb that's what i that's what i'm in now found an airbnb in the baltimore area close to 
the facility, I moved my stuff in and my family's still back in Arizona in our long-term home. Cause that's, that's where we call it home. And, you know, we're kind of just figuring out from here, from here. So it's pretty hectic. You know, I've never, this is the craziest situation I've been in. I had less than 24 hours to pack and move across the country for the rest of the year. But, um, you know, it, it just kind of comes with the territory and it also kind of, it's a freeing feeling though, because I'm doing this cause I want to, I never wanted to be the player, especially at this point in my career, who was making moves like this because I had to like, man, I need more money. So for me, it's like, I still want to play. My wife was comfortable with it. My kids are still pretty young. Like this is a little inconvenient, but all right, I'm going to go to Baltimore make the most of the season. We got a chance to make a real playoff push, et cetera. Instead of like, man, I don't want to do this, but I, I need the money. So I have to go. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's really a freeing feeling when you're, when you're able to move out of choice and not out of like have to. I've heard you use the phrase trust, but verify when it comes to selecting investment partners or just choosing deals to invest in. And this phrase is, you know, because it's it's so commonly used in the Bitcoin community, it got me curious about how you invest outside of real estate. And if you invest in Bitcoin, we've seen others like Russell Okung and Odell Beckham take portions of their salaries in, in Bitcoin. How do you approach portfolio allocation and what assets are you interested in outside of real estate? In my humble opinion, them boys are tripping. <laughs> like, I can't believe, I can't believe they're trying to take salaries in Bitcoin. Um, I'll be lying if I didn't say it piqued my interest some. So I like, you know, I got a Robin Hood account and a Coinbase account. And I put a couple of like, I think I have a total of like maybe $10,000 in the crypto space, which is a pretty small percentage, a very small percentage of anything. It's kind of just was mesh around money for me. Like, let's see what this, what's, what's going on with this. But for me, I never fully understood it and understand it now. And it seems so volatile to where, it was, it was more so like a fun, like I put enough money into it to where I, I would like kind of keep up with it and see what was happening, but I don't believe in it enough to invest real money that actually matters to me. And it's hard to say for me outside of real estate, it's like different ways to do real estate. My, I am very much allocated to real estate. And what I mean by that is I own 22 properties myself now and actively looking for more. So hopefully you know, that number is going to be increasing or, um, by the end of the year or early next year. But outside of that, I invest in a lot of syndications as well. And I feel like with where I'm at in my life, the fact that I'm a professional athlete, I have extra income coming in. Syndications has been a great tool to help get the cash flow that I feel like I need as a professional athlete for when my career is done. And it's something I talk a lot about with high wealth earners, including athletes and entertainers, because you don't know how long you're going to be able to do what you do. Like, I think the most important factor that people miss out on is before anything else, you have to invest for cash flow because that is what frees you, in my opinion. So what's your number? Whatever your number is, what do you, what's the number that you need to sustain your life? And, and in my opinion, people should be chasing that number because if you have a job, if you have a job, but you can get to the point where you're generating $10,000 a month in, in passive income, you could keep that job, but you're now working because you want to, not because you have to. And I mentioned that a second ago. And so like, I think that's the mindset that I've always had is like, I know football is not going to last forever. So I wanted to make sure I had enough income coming in to where I, like, I can use that money to live even if football wasn't in the picture anymore. And that mindset is how I've always invested. And that's why I've kind of brought me to so much real estate. But um, I have some money like retirement accounts and things like that in stock market and stuff. But to be honest with you, I'm heavily leveraged in real estate. How does this go over in NFL locker rooms when you talk about this stuff? Do guys like agree? Do they kind of, they just like, no man, we're, you know, we're rich. Let's buy Lambos. Like what, what is that conversation like? The language in the locker room has evolved and changed a lot over the last few years. Guys are getting more sophisticated, but there's not a lot of guys who are really tapped into the real estate world, but they're definitely interested. And, you know, for me, it was humbling early on because I started out and most guys are in, like have financial advisors and they're in the stock market and, you know, portfolio allocations and, and all, all of this stuff. And 
I started out that way a little bit when I first got in the league and I'm like losing money. It's fluctuating up and down. And I'm like, this just isn't doing what I really want my investments to do. Like I want consistency. I want cash flow. Like I want it to grow and appreciate. Right. But like, what about in the meantime, like if I'm done playing, what is this fluctuating speculative, like investing doing for me on the day to day and providing for my lifestyle. So it was kind of new for me once I started investing in real estate because I didn't hear a lot of people doing it. And I thought like, it makes sense to me, but am I doing something wrong? Because why isn't anybody else kind of really doing this? And it made me like really dig deep to learn because I'm like, this sounds right, but why isn't anybody else doing it? I have to be tripping. Like, What am I missing? And the more I started to learn, the more podcasts I listened to, the more books I read, the more people I talked to, it's like people are just afraid to do the work or just they just don't know how to evaluate a good deal and they don't know what to look for essentially so they don't do it. So if I learn that, I can put myself and have a distinct advantage. And now it's kind of like, all right, it's growing more popular and guys are asking about it and asking questions and I'm becoming well known for investing in different kinds of real estate. And I just see that there's a gap with execution now. So guys are interested, but who's going to actually learn how to underwrite a deal? Who's going to actually learn how to um, look at, you know, a pro forma? Who's going to look at an operating agreement from a syndication and, and know what disposition fees are and, and assignment fees and, and all these things to be able to evaluate, like, does this deal make sense? What's your ROI? What's your um, IRR? What's your cash on cash? Like, you know, learn the language. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys kind of get overwhelmed with that stuff. So they just, they're like, oh, interested, but then don't, don't do much from there. So how can somebody like, say myself, who is an investor and they are looking for investors you have a bunch of people in the NFL, they're really interested in real estate. They may not have the time or interest to learn to do it themselves. How do you get on the radar of professional athletes or high income earners like that, or even like get in contact with them to potentially invest in their, in your own deals, like in a deal that I was doing or somebody else is listening to the show? I would say be a good teacher and understand the flip side of trust, but verify. So professional athletes are going to be very skeptical. So you got to be willing to allow them to trust, but verify like, oh, that sounds good, but you're going to have to walk them through and get them to feel very comfortable and take the time to teach. I don't think there's enough people who are teaching, especially professional athletes, because, you know, sometimes they don't, it's their own fault because they're not trying to learn or be active learners, but understand the investment and understand why it's a good, understand the risk and giving realistic projections and numbers. And so it's transparent because a lot of the times I've seen been approached by investors like yourself or someone to who is approaching other professional athletes and they're giving them unrealistic numbers, you know, pro formas that's not including any kind of CapEx and, you know, the repair and maintenance is, is way too low. And they're not even factoring in property management. And it's like, this guy's going to buy one property. It's not going to perform how you said it was. And he's, and he's going to be turned off from doing, from doing real estate ever again, because you gave him an unrealistic picture. You know, you, we're assuring this grandioso return and it wasn't real from the start. So I feel like transparency and teaching is the gap that needs to be, to be fed. And, and that's what I've been trying to feel is like, helping guys understand that it's not that hard. We, we understand playbooks, football playbooks, and to a, a normal person, it would look like Japanese, you know, some of our plays and what we're going. So all it is is another language. Real estate and financial literacy is just another language that I try to tell guys you can learn and it's not that hard, but you just got to put in a little effort just like you would, you know, on the football field to learn a football playbook. Are you familiar with uh, Jedediah Collins, the fullback? Uh, that was in the NFL. He's big in the finance and investing space now. Uh, absolutely. We we hold some classes together through the NFL and we've been talking about doing some some more work together in, in the future. So hopefully that kind of pans out. Yeah, he's awesome. He's been a, a guest here on the show two or three times now. So I figured you guys, like you said, there's not a ton of guys that are interested in it and you're becoming well known for real estate. So I figured you guys, you guys had connected. But going back, you mentioned that you didn't like 
how the stock market was kind of, you know, you gave some of your money to the finance, your finance guy, your quote unquote finance guy when you first got in the league, but you didn't love how the stock market was going up and down too much. It wasn't consistent, didn't have cash flow. How did you decide to get started in real estate? What was your first deal like? What did that, what did that look like? How'd you actually get started? So there was two things that kind of happened simultaneously for me. One, I was connected and it was like my syndication journey. I was connected with a financial advisor whose sole focus was was completely different than every financial advisor I know in the NFL, just stock market. He essentially analyzes syndications all over the country and brings the best ones he can find to his clients. Um, and most of them are real estate backed, apartment complexes, hotels, single family um, deals, and it's mostly private. So uh, there was another player who introduced me to him and it sounded too good to be true because I had a real estate background. It wasn't foreign to me, but I'm like some of the returns and he's like talking about dividends, 8% cash on cash yearly, given out quarterly. And it's like, that sounds exactly like what I want, but it sounds too good to be true. So I, I was very skeptical and I started out with just putting 35K into um, essentially a fund that lend, did short-term lending uh, to people who were like building apartment complexes or, you know, commercial properties, what have you. And, you know, it was backed by the real estate. So if they didn't pay their loan, we would take over that apartment complex or that that building. So conceptually, that made sense for sense to me, but I was like, I was still nervous. So I just I put 35K and I let that ride for like a year and a half. I, like I didn't invest any more with him. He kept bringing me new deals, but I ca- started kind of to see every quarter I was getting paid quarterly, just like he said. Um, and it was what he said, if not more every, every year. And I'm like, this is really good cash flow. And it's kind of doing what I want an investment to do for me. So that gave me some confidence. And while that was going on, I was listening to other real estate podcasts and I got connected with two different um, syndicators who who were doing uh, syndications in Ohio and Kansas City. One of them I I found through a Bigger Pockets uh, episode. He was talking about turnkey properties in Kansas City and he was a turnkey provider. And I was like, well, that sounds like exactly what I need and want right now. I don't want a property that I need to do a bunch of work to. I want to find markets where I can invest, get a solid cash flow. It's going to appreciate over time. So I connected with him. It was all season. I went to Kansas City, met with him, and um, I met with third-party property management. I felt comfortable. So I started buying properties there while simultaneously doing the same thing in Ohio and starting... um, you know, I met a guy who owned a syndication, a pretty large one, buying thousands of homes in the, in Ohio, and he actually graduated from USC. So that ties back to networking. And I, I kind of negotiated a way to him for him to allow me to to carve out my own portfolio through the syndication. And they were going to let me kind of ha- hand pick a few properties that I can buy and add to my personal portfolio. So I was I started simultaneously like doing syndications and buying my own my own deals and kind of bal- doing the balancing act and I've kind of maintained that along the way. Now I'm in, you know, over 30 syndications and have a large portion of my uh portfolio giving me off dividends. I'm getting appreciation for those and then I own 22 properties myself and kind of moving forward my plan is as my football career ends some of those syndications will go full cycle. I'll get my principal back, all of that. And now I'll have a decision to make. Do I want to continue to buy my own stuff or reinvest in syndications? But I'm going to have more time. So I'm kind of thinking I'm going to keep growing my personal portfolio and hopefully get to 50 doors, 100 doors and you know go from there. When you were buying those original turnkey deals, you weren't doing it with much leverage, were you? I bought 12 properties, six in Ohio, six in Kansas City, all cash. But um, I didn't buy them all at once. I did Ohio first. I bought a uh, a bunch of, I bought three properties and it was about 300K and then let that ride for a little, little bit and then bought three more in Ohio. And that went well. And then I did Kansas City and I did the same di- thing, bought three and then bought three more and it was all cash. And, um, and I'm starting to, I started to see like, man, I'm generating 10K plus net of fees from 12 properties and they all costed me about a hundred thousand dollars give or take a door 
I'm liking, I'm liking how this looks and feels. And I wrote that out for a while. And I recently just refinanced those properties. And I did so because I, um, they appreciated enough to where I had put $1.2 million into the, into all those properties cash. And I was able to draw out 1.1 and still cash flow. So, you know, now I have virtually no skin in the game and I still have properties that are cash flowing. Now, hindsight, I probably took out too much because I've had some issues with my Ohio properties and some of them have been a little bit of alligators since I've refinanced. So I, I've had to hire new property management and, and get them. And I'm trying to get those a little managed, a little tighter. So they are cash flowing how I expected, but it was my first refinance. So I'm, I'm learning a lesson through do this. Like next time around, I probably, even if I could take all the cash out, I might leave some in just to make sure I leave a little leeway. Cause I, even though all the cash is out and I've made great cash flow over the years, I don't like, I don't like being in the red ever. It's like, it, uh, it kind of upsets me. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one lesson I've kind of learned through the refinance game this last year. Why didn't you finance them from the beginning? Why'd you pay all cash? Uh, that mindset that I was telling you to where I wanted the, I wanted the cash flow. Like, so my, my number was 15 K. I felt like if I could bring in 15 K a month cash flow, like that's going to more than provide the lifestyle that I wanted. And what's the fastest way to do that? I started seeing some of that cash flow through appreciation. And then I started, I invested in these 12 properties and I was generating that off of 12, pro, uh, you know, 10 K plus off of 12 properties. And it made me realize like, wow, I'm, I'm already there. And, um, you know, so that, that's, was my mindset. And I like leverage presents, presents risk. Um, even now I told you I refinanced and now I got some properties that's been in the red a little bit. Like but when I, when I own these properties cash, if it took a month, month and a half for a tenant to get replaced, you know, it wasn't killing me before. Cause it was like, my cash flow is not as great right now. Cause I got a tenant, I, I got to get a new tenant in there, but it wasn't like I owe anybody money. I don't have a mortgage payment to make. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And for me, that's, that's a freeing feeling. So, um, I would say now I still don't want to be heavily, heavily leveraged. Like, I think I'm going to have the mindset of, I rather have less properties with less leverage, like either bought out cash or, or 50% leverage, six, like a, a low loan to value than heavily leveraged, um, than heavily, heavily leveraged stuff. And that's, you know, for me, I've realized that's just my comfort zone. Some people would say the opposite and, and get as much leverage as you can. So they, so you can keep scaling. And it's like, you can have a smaller portfolio, pay it off faster or have in and have less paid off and be cash flowing and living the life that you want better than if you had a hundred properties heavily leveraged and you're stressed out. Um, so I feel like it's it's kind of to each their own, but I've I've kind of realized I'll probably leverage on the lower side um, for majority of my real estate journey. I think it depends where you are in your financial life, where you are in your career too. Like somebody who's early on, like they're probably going to have to be a little bit higher leverage, and then as you get a little bit later on in your journey, you're worth more money. You want to kind of preserve what you've earned and you don't want to, you don't have to take as much risk because you don't need to, to, to scale and it's not worth the risk. But when you're starting early on, sometimes you have to, you have to take a little bit more risk at the beginning. I think that's a really good point you make with saying that. Cause if say like I kind of, we were talking about, oh, if I only played one year, if I only played one year and only had a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, I would take more risk than I've had a nine year NFL career. Now I've, I've been blessed to make a good amount of money. So I think, you know, it, it's very relative to where you're at in your financial stability standpoint. And, you know, I, I feel like I've done the hard work in that I've made money through the NFL. So it's like, I don't want to take great risk necessarily if I don't have to. Yeah. You don't want to lose all that money that you, you know, that hard earned money that you've, you've done and you're already at a spot where you're in a good financial position. So it doesn't like that risk is not worth the return. Exactly. Had you picked the locations in Ohio and in Kansas City? Did you just trust a, a third party manager, somebody that you had on the ground there that told you those were good neighborhoods? Like, how did you pick? And and I'm also curious, why did you pick single family houses? And and talk to us a little bit about that. Like, are you doing small multifamily? Are you doing anything bigger? Like, what does that look like? So I think I got to go back. So 
my first actual property was in Beach Grove, Indiana. And that happened because I had an old teammate from USC who was in the NFL too. And, and he invited me to go to a real estate meetup with him. And doing this real estate meetup, we met a guy who was buying a bunch of homes in Ohio, flipping them. And um, I'm not Ohio, I'm in Indiana. So we went out to Indiana, learned his system and, and how he was doing something. And we took a chance and we bought an $86,000 property together, each put 12K down. And that was actually my first, first like taste of any kind of real estate before even Ohio and before syndications, actually. I liked it, but then I realized I got to pick markets I can scale because that guy kind of ghosted us after that. And I was like, this property had, per, was performing great for us, but like one property is not doing it. Like, you know, especially when you're buying a single family property, I need to go somewhere where I can trust that I can buy several and kind of stack. And, um, you know, that made me realize like, all right, I can need to find markets that I can do that in. And my risk tolerance is fairly low and I wanted to get into real estate, but I would get, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Properties are way more expensive. So when I started to learn about what, like Indiana, where I bought my first property, and then I got introduced to Ohio, Kansas City, you're talking about three bed, two baths for around a hundred thousand dollars. I was like, I can stomach that. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that, that would hurt if it tanked, but it wouldn't completely kill me as opposed to like, I buy a $400,000 property and I can't pay that mortgage. Like, you know, th that hits a, a whole lot different. You know what I mean? So I think that re was really my motivation. And then that just so happened to be where I found providers who were providing turnkey opportunities. And I felt comfortable that they can, that I could scale in those markets. So then it was just, is there good property managers? But if you're finding a turnkey provider, they have two or three property management companies they recommend at least. So, you know, you pretty much interview them and consider who's the best fit, what the, what's their criteria for tenant screenings, et cetera, and, and uh, you know, kind of go from there. But once you do it, it's kind of plug and play because you're getting statements monthly from your property management and you're just making sure the numbers make sense, approving any expenses that that come through and it becomes a numbers game at that point. Are those 22 properties that you own personally, not including any of the syndications, are they all single family? Mostly, but I've, I've been going more towards smaller multifamily, so duplexes. And um, so I have a few are duplexes. I think four of those are duplexes now. So I'm not afraid of single family at all. And I started out in single family, honestly, just because of the risk. Like it was cheaper. It was cheaper. And I felt like, if I had to go and buy a 12 unit from the get go, I probably still would not own any properties myself because it would like for the first time that scared me. So for me, like some people live by multifamily and I think there's a good chance I will slowly grow into that, but I plan on doing real estate the rest of my life. I don't have to be in a rush. And I mean, you're involved in multifamily through syndications, so it's not like you're through not syndications. Anyways. Exactly. Yeah. Anyways, I'm getting that exposure through syndications anyway. So the single family and smaller, smaller multifamily, you know, quads and lower is still, even till the today is my comfort zone. I think when I'm done playing and I'm putting a lot more time, maybe I'll consider bigger, bigger things, but like, you know, I can, I can stomach and visualize, you know, a fourplex, a triplex, a duplex, a single family, just, just easier um, financially and just the risk tolerance. And I, I felt like early on, that's all I could stomach is like the Midwest, cheaper homes, let, let's go that route. And it allowed me to get going. And then I, then I built a good portfolio from that. And now, okay, let me, I, I'm looking primarily at duplexes and triplexes and quads now. And, and I, I think I'll keep kind of stacking those because I feel like that's a very unique niche that some of those big black stones and stuff aren't necessarily always pursuing it's like, you know, you're going to get 20 units. You're competing with a lot of people. If I have good expertise and I'm going for a quad, you know, my competition might be a little less and I might be able to, to you know, take advantage of, of that kind of pocket of opportunities better than the next person. It's funny. Our, our kind of background and story to get into real estate is very similar. When I, I was like ready, I'd done a couple of house hacks. I was ready to buy my first rental, but I live in the Boston area and it's expensive. Just, I mean, probably just like Phoenix. And so 
Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm going to buy this like duplex, like two to four unit is what I wanted to buy for a rental. And I was looking at like 120 to $150,000 down. And then the property was probably like five, 600,000. And that was like pretty much on the low end. And I'm like, man, like, I, I mean, I was 22 at the time. I didn't have that much money. I had a little bit, but like, I just couldn't make that happen. And so I was like, okay, I got to figure something out. And I wasted probably six to nine months because I was set on having multifamily. And then I basically had the same realization with you as you did. And you're like, if I waited for a 12 unit, I wouldn't have never got started. And it was the same for me. I was like, you know what? I need to just find a single family that I can afford. And so what I did, I know this is going to sound kind of crazy, but my background's in finance. So I hired a software developer to scrape demographic data for 7,000 cities across the US. He gave it to me all in a spreadsheet. And I ranked every single city in the US from one to 7,000. And I just started looking for every single one that had properties that I could afford. And I found this little town in Texas that had, like you said, a three bed, two bath house with a garage, beautiful fenced in yard, great school district, everything. And it was $65,000 total, like purchase price. And I'm like, all right, you know what? I can do that. Like we're talking $10,000 down. The monthly payment is 500 bucks. I was like, for the mortgage, I'm like, worst case, if this just goes to crap, I can, you know, I can afford that. I can cover this property. You could figure that out. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Right. And float it until I, until I needed to sell it. So I did it. And then ever since then, it's, it's worked really well. And, and I thought about going the turnkey route that you mentioned. But for me, I personally didn't like that because I was like, you know what? I'm an individual guy. I can't compete with these people. So I'm not going to not gonna go into these markets that they're in, even though they might be good markets. I was like, I need to go somewhere where there's not a lot of investors. That's how I found this little town in Texas. But yeah, it's, it's funny. Same, same path for me. Yeah. That, I mean, I think that's so smart. And that's what I recommend so many people because there's so many people who don't wait or you have the, the group of people who will say uh it's uh it takes just as much effort to do 12 units as it does to do one so just do and and you know you hear all that talking they can be very much well right but psychologically financially buying a hundred thousand dollars feels a lot different than buying a, a million dollar property you know, i'm sorry i don't care if it takes the same amount of work so if you need to buy the hundred thousand dollar property first and build into eventually buying the million dollars, then go, then go ahead and do that. And I, I like your story because, I mean, I think if I wasn't in the NFL, I knew I was like, I know I'm leaving meat on the bone because so many of my properties were turnkey. Like, you know, like they got to make a, they got to make a little money in the, in between. Like if I'm finding and sourcing these deals more myself, I'd be able to get a better return and, oh, I do some of the renovations. So I'm forcing a little equity myself that I'm capturing. So I'm fully aware that I have a portfolio that I haven't fully taken advantage of and left meat on the bone. But that was the same mindset in the sense of, so I'm just going to keep waiting. Like I'm finding deals that even though they're turnkey, they work. They're giving me the kind of return that I would, I would want. So because I know that I'm not making as much money as I would if I found these deals on my own. I'm just not going to do them. Like for me, that didn't sit well. It was like, let me do the deals that make the most sense for me right now. And I don't want to have to deal with a remodel and trusting contractors and managing that. And like, let me buy stable properties, get good property management who's going to put a good tenant in there and let that thing ride out. And I mean, I've had a good return doing that and that's not using as much opportunity as I could because I'm buying turnkey. So I'm like, I kind of, my mindset is hopefully I'll be able to find better and better deals as my, my football career ends. And I could put more focus and time into, into finding and identifying properties and creating renovation budgets and getting a contracting team in the cities that I want to work in and, and those things. So my advice to anybody out there is whatever your circumstances get your first deal done and get the ball rolling and your deals will probably become better and better over time, but it's okay if you're hitting a single or a double right off the bat. And I think so many people don't invest because they want a triple or, or a home run. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, you hit a single or a double consistently, they start to stack and it starts to look really, really good. And that's even over a two, three, five year period. I haven't got to the point where I've held any real estate 10 plus years. And I can say even in a three to five year window, you know, just investing, it, you'll, you'll be happy you did in three to five years. No question. 
I know I love the baseball analogies, singles, doubles, triples, home runs, but in your case, you just got to get a first down, right? You're not, you know, you're not going for, yeah. you're not throwing a Hail Mary. You don't need to get a Hail Mary property. You just need to get a first down and then buy another first down and then get another first down. Before you know it, you're in the end zone. You got, you know, you got a touchdown. You get a great property. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I know you, you went to the Limitless Conference. I know you like Bigger Pockets and Brandon Turner and I had him here on the show. And, and one of the things that I really like that, that he taught me is something that you talked about is you're like, I know these turnkey guys are making some money off me. And Brandon talks about this. He says, if, if your numbers still work for you, like it's fine if other people make money. You know, he talks about this because a lot of people will buy from wholesalers and they get mad that they're paying a wholesaler fee, but it's like the numbers still work for you. Like everybody can get their, their share. Everybody can make money on the deal. As long as it works for you, then, then really who cares, you know, if, if they're making money too. And it's the same case with your turnkey providers. Well, and, and then that's the same mindset with syndications. Like I hear so many people like, I can't believe you got so much money in syndications. Those guys, like they're really the general partners, the GPs, uh, the syndicators, you know, they you can call them a bunch of different things. Typically the GPs are syndicators, but they're, they're making a killing off of your money. And I'm like, I know they're doing really good, but I'm doing pretty dang good off of it too. So it's like, I, I mean, it depends what you want to do, because if you want to be the one that's doing really good and hitting it out of the park, then you got to be, they're the ones that has the loan in their name and they're finding the deal and they're doing the under, they're doing all the dirty work. For me, I'm evaluating the information and the deal that they're bringing to me with my team, deciding if it's a deal that I believe in and it's good. And if it is, I'm investing and keeping track as stuff goes. That's my work. It's a little more work under up front with underwriting it. And making sure that their projections, their performance, it all makes sense. I believe in their philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, it's just looking at statements, making sure they paid when they said they're going to pay, getting the updates. So if I'm making a uh, preferred return of 8% and it's going to be a five-year hold and they're telling me it's going to be a 15 to 20% IRR, I'm not mad at that because, the, okay, they're making in the end, 25, 30% or whatever they're making on the money that they invested into the deal. It's like, all right, they're, they're making a killing, but I'm making a solid 15% IRR, 20% IRR on this deal over five years. And I, and it took me some due diligence up front and some keeping track of it along the way. And I have that same mindset with turnkey, uh, with turnkey providers and buying turnkey properties. It's like, most of my work is up front, making sure the numbers make sense. The market is the rents. I'm going to be able to get what they say. The, the property CapEx issues are controllable. And after that, property management's ha handling it all. And I'm just making sure the statements are making sense. So I'm able to focus on football while still making a really solid return in these investments. So I think people need to accept like it's OK if other people are making making money around you and you're leveraging that. You know, it depends on your goals and what you're trying to accomplish. I know you're a soon to be author yourself. Tell us a bit about your book as we wrap up the episode today. Yeah, so it's going to be coming out April 18th. It's called It All Adds Up, Your Financial Goals and Reaching Your Financial Dreams. And it's essentially talking a lot about what we talked about today, because I feel like the American dream has changed so much and people are still chasing what society told us we're supposed to. And it's failing so many people. And I feel like we're at a unique point in society to where you can reach financial freedom so many different ways and you can make money so many different ways and people need to broaden their horizon. And you see a lot of people doing it. I just think it needs to become the common thread. Like, hey, like if you're a cook, you can create a business and become and uh, online classes and YouTube channels and making legitimate money off of what you're passionate about and cooking. But the, so taking whatever you're good at and passionate about and, you know, leveraging that to the best of your ability to maximize your earnings and then investing that in things that's going to give you more cash flow to where you're having multiple revenue streams. And, you know, that's what I talked a lot about, about in my book is, you know, football has been a vehicle for me to maximize my earning potential doing something that I'm really passionate about. But then the next step, which is just as important, is what do you do with that money from there? And how do you invest it? How do you look at it? And I think everyone needs to take that perspective and become exceptional at whatever your career path is or and maximize your earning potential and then figure out vehicles. I think the best vehicle is real estate to invest that money and create other 
income streams to where you're living life on your terms. So yeah, I'm really excited about my book coming out. I hope everybody, you know, checks it out. And once it comes out, I'll have to come back on and we can, we can uh, hash it out some more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually just published a book uh, earlier this year with Simon and Schuster. So I know that's a big undertaking. I can't imagine how you're doing it while in the NFL, your portfolio and, and writing. So I know it's a, a big deal. I'm uh, looking forward to getting my hands on a copy and, and we'll definitely have you back to to chat about it. Tell us, uh, Devon, where, where people can go to find you, your website, social, your, find your book when it comes out. Like, Where do you want people to go to, to connect with you? Pretty much everything is my name. So you can go to www.devonkennard. That's my website and social media. I have just about everything, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and it's just at Devon Kennard. So appreciate the follow. And man, this has been a great conversation. So thanks for having me on, Robert. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and truly, thank you for taking time out of your day. I know you're a busy guy, so I really appreciate you joining me. Absolutely. Figure out what you want to do. You know, if you want to get into self-storage, you want to get into brokering or flipping or fixing, there's plenty of avenues. There's plenty of things out there in order to train you to teach you how to do those sorts of things. It's not that hard. What's hard is making sure that you do it right. If that's what you want to get passionate about, great. We'll love to help you on that process. And as a gift to your listeners, if they reference this show, we'll give them two things. 